Hello, everybody. Uh, love to get started for you today. As I just mentioned, uh, I didn't bring my laptop because uh, I had been given many fear-mongering tales, excuse me, uh, of DEF CON and the fear vicious hackers within, as this is my first time at DEF CON. Um, now, ideally, we're going to have uh, a laptop from the uh, XR Village host for me to present on, but unfortunately, I haven't been able to get in contact with her. So I'm going to do uh, what is called a pro gamer move and ask if anybody in the audience has a laptop they would be willing to let me present my slides from. This is a great look for me, I know. Uh, if not, that's okay. We will, I'll, I'll bring it on my phone for you and you all can just um, look, at the, look at the slides from here. That'll work, right? Uh, uh, well, that's all right. Uh, we'll do this theater of the mind. So, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Dylan Fox, uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about XR for All, Accessibility and Privacy for Disabled Users. Uh, I am the Director of Operations for XR Access, which I'll be talking to you about in just a moment. Uh, and you can reach me at uh, dylan at xraccess.org. Uh, our agenda today is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the XR Access initiative that I represent. Uh, we're going to talk about the benefits that accessibility-focused XR can provide to people with disabilities. Uh, we're talking about the privacy risks that those benefits come along with, uh, and then best practices for mitigating those risks, or how we can have the, the best of both worlds. Uh, and then hopefully at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, so, to start with, uh, the XR Access Initiative uh, is a community dedicated to connecting people in order to make virtual augmented and mixed reality accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, we were originally founded in 2019 as just kind of a, a community of people coming together to, who wanted to make this new tech accessible. Uh, and now we are a proud research initiative of Cornell Tech in New York. Uh, we do a lot in terms of researching the fundamentals of accessibility. You know, how do we make these technologies accessible, especially to blind and low vision people? Uh, we also make a lot of resources that we provide to designers and developers on how to make their apps accessible. Uh, we con connect different communities in terms of the uh, big, you know, the big technical platforms, the content creators, uh, researchers, government people, uh, and of course, people who are disabled and advocates. Uh, in order to come together to solve some of these really thorny problems uh, on how to make these things accessible. Uh, and we advocate and educate for XR accessibility, just like I'm doing right here. Uh, we also hold every year our XR Access Symposium. Uh, you just missed the one June 6th and 7th, but uh, we have our uh, all of our videos up on YouTube, so if you're interested in learning more about kind of the hot topics in XR accessibility, uh, I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, our website is xraccess.org. So let's talk about accessibility-focused XR. Now, XR, for those of you who aren't aware, is uh, an umbrella term uh, referring to extended reality. Uh, and that covers virtual reality, where you are immersed in this virtual space, augmented reality, where you augment reality with data, uh, and mixed reality, which is a little column A and a little column B. Uh, and all of these come together to form a, a technology that has really grown in popularity over the last five or 10 years, uh, and is really poised to make a big change in people's lives if we use it correctly. So that's XR. What about the accessibility half of XR accessibility? Now, the first thing, the notion that I want to dispel for you all is that accessibility is a checklist that you run down in order to support a few people who are in wheelchairs or what have you out of the goodness of your heart. Because that's a lie. Uh, accessibility affects all of us. Accessibility is defined as basically being able to use something no matter what your ability is. Because we all have abilities to see, to hear, to touch. Um, and sometimes those abilities can become hampered, right? Uh, now that can be permanently, right? If you are, you know, have a genetic condition that 
makes you born without ears, you're probably deaf, right? And that would be a permanent condition. But you might also be deaf because you have an ear infection, or you might be deaf because you're at a really loud bar, like, you know, the middle of the arcade party last night. That thing was deafening. Um, and accessibility will help everybody, no matter what that source of disability is from. Because disability isn't really just about your hampered ability. Disability is when your abilities don't match up with the expectations or the assumptions of the technology that you use or the spaces around you. So somebody in a wheelchair is not disabled inherently. They are disabled when they come to a place that the only way to get in is stairs, right? You know, never use the term wheelchair bound because a lot of the people that use wheelchairs will tell you, I'm not bound to this wheelchair. The wheelchair is what gives me mobility. It's what lets me move around and be where I want to be. So when we talk about accessibility, accessibility is about technology that adapts to your needs. It's about technology that no matter what your abilities are, you'll still be able to use. Uh, there's a, a woman, Cindy Lee, who wrote the book on CSS and was also an, a, an accomplished accessibility advocate. Uh, and she had this idea that we're all just temporarily abled, right? All of us, uh, at some time or another, where we're just in a loud room or we get old and our ability, bodies start to fail us, all of us will be disabled at some point in our lives. So when we're talking about accessibility, don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, accessibility, that's for those people over there. Oh, accessibility, that's the thing that freaking bureaucrats make me want to check off a list so we don't get sued. It's not the case. Accessibility is for all of us. Quick, quick show of hand, who here in the audience uh, has either personally experienced accessibility, uh, or rather personally experienced disability, or has a relative who has disabilities? Show, show of hands. I know I have. That's a good portion of you, and I think 100% of the people that are actually paying attention and thinking about it. So where does that leave us on accessibility and XR? Well, there's two perspectives when it comes to XR accessibility. The first is this idea of core platform accessibility, and that is the idea that every single XR app from you know Beat Saber to Vacation Simulator to you know, all the stuff you see in the XR Village upstairs of working on labs and uh, simulating national disasters, all of those should be accessible to anybody that wants to use them. The second way of thinking about XR accessibility is about XR as assistive technology. And so this would be tools that are aimed specifically at people with disabilities to support them and their use in everyday life. Now, normally, I would focus this talk on core platform accessibility. You know, that's things like the curb cut effect, right? You ever know those curb cuts, the little things that go from the sidewalk down to the street? They didn't have those back before, like, the 1960s. There was a whole disability civil rights movement where people were sneaking out at night to take sledgehammers to sidewalks and then put in, uh, you know, wooden ramps. And... Once, you know, they, people had to fight tooth and nail to get these in for wheelchair users so that wheelchair users didn't have to, you know, wheel through the streets and be hit by cars. And once they did that, they realized, oh, hold on a sec, guys. I think, I think these are useful for everybody. <laughs> they found that these curb cuts weren't just useful for people in wheelchairs, people who, you know, had no mobility. Uh, they were useful for people on bicycles and people with baby strollers and people with heavy dollies full of crap. So these types of things, you know, when we make uh, when we make things accessible for people with disabilities, we make them better for everybody. So that's usually what I would do a whole 30 minute talk about, right? We talk about things like uh, captions in VR, we talk about magnification, we talk about co-piloting, uh, all the features that if you are designing or developing a, a VR, AR, XR app, you would put in to make it more usable. But today, we're talking about something else because I know you all here uh, at DEF CON uh, care about a little thing called privacy, right? And there is a very interesting tension between accessibility and privacy when it comes to XR. 
because there are some tools like, for example, facial recognition, that if you are blind or you have, uh, you know, prosopagnosia, which is like face blindness, the inability to remember faces, uh, or if you just have memory problems, facial recognition could be a very helpful tool, right? Being able to have a little reminder of, oh, your brother just walked into the room. Oh, here comes your friend Sam, right? That's really useful. But if that comes at the cost of every single person's face you see ending up in some meta or NSA database, that cost might not really be worth it, right? So we have to figure out how to balance these. So I want to start with the good news, uh, which is that there are some really powerful uses of this assistive technology. Um, if I had my slides, <laughs> which I would, uh, I would show you that, uh, you know, there's technologies like OR cam, which is a, a, a camera that you stick onto your glasses that helps to uh, provide things like facial recognition, um, what types of, you know, what denominations of currency do I have? What color is my shirt? What's this text in front of me? Uh, applications that are really helpful if you are blind so that you don't have to, you know, just hope that there's a braille pattern or a uh, audio version or somebody nearby who can read it out loud to you. Uh, these types of technologies offer huge levels of independence uh, to people that, that have disabilities. Um, there's tools like Be My AIs as well coming out recently that, you know, even more questions arise from this type of thing. These are tools that let you take a photo of something and then have a conversation with a chatbot about what's in it. Uh, and if you look at YouTube, there's examples of people saying, okay, you know, what's here? Oh, well, there's a microwave on a shelf. There's a knife next to it. Okay, where's the button for popcorn on my microwave? Oh, it's the second button down on the left, right? That is incredible. That is game changing for blind people. But again, we run into these challenges of, well, it's fantastic that the blind person has access to this data. Who else gets access to that data? Uh, other examples I have here are things like captioning glasses, right? Um, for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, uh, or for people who don't have English as a first language, there are captioning glasses by companies like uh, Xander and XRAI that will listen to what's going on and present a little transcript uh, for you to read. Uh, and this is, again, something, if you are deaf, that makes you much more independent, much more able to partake in your kind of social life, uh, talk to people, and yet, who else can now read all of the conversations you're having? Um, so there are many more examples of this, right? There's, there's many more things I could describe to you about uh, how XR can enable all of these assistive technologies. But let's take a moment to talk about the risks. So the risks here are that in order for these things to function, they basically act as little data vacuums, just sucking up uh, either discreetly or continuously data about you in terms of your gaze, your motion, uh, your biometric data, your location, or data about your surroundings, you know, visual, auditory, temporal, spatial. Uh, and those, that, as you might expect, comes with a lot of risks. Um, three of them that I'd highlight for you. First is non-consensual recording. So let's say you have uh, Billy, who's blind, right? And he wants to be able to recognize when his friend walks in the room. So he has a facial recognition app. Now that is going to have to look at the face of everybody that walks into the room to function. Uh, now, how do we stop that from now reporting about all of the different bystanders that Billy doesn't care about, that did not give consent for that? How do we keep their identities safe, but still make this tool useful? Uh, you can also think about the challenges of 3D mapping, right? You know, if you are at a public university, a library, an airport, uh, it's fantastic to have a 3D map of that for your navigation applications to be able to guide you to your gate, guide you to the classroom you're going to. But let's say, I, you know, I'm wearing my headset because I, I did my master's thesis on this of augmented reality for visually impaired people where we're using the HoloLens's ability to map out the environment uh, and then communicate useful things about that. Now, let's say I'm wearing this. As I walk around, it's mapping the space around me. 
you know, if I go into my home and I map out my home, I now have a digital twin of my home, who has access to that twin, right? Same if I go into a, a private facility or a government office that they don't really take kindly to there being a bunch of 3D maps floating around on the internet. Uh, how do we keep those safe? And all of these challenges with recording are doubled or tripled in things like educational settings and healthcare settings, uh, where there are major rules and laws covering what you can and can't record. Another big risk is data retention, right? Let's say I need to pass some data up to the cloud to get processed. Is it there and then gone? Is it just held in the moment? Or is it parked in some big server farm somewhere? That means the organization that I've sent it to now can use it in perpetuity or, you know, until they get a data breach and now everybody has that information. Uh, wanting to make sure that when we do pass information to the cloud, that it's only held for just as long as it needs to be is really important to keeping all our privacy safe. Finally, and I'm gonna dip into science fiction a little bit for this one because I'm, guess, I'm guessing that many of you, like me, are giant frickin' nerds. Um, you can look at things like uh, Ghost in the Shell standalone complex for examples of perception hacking. You know, if somebody is able to hack your headset, not only are they getting a record of everything that you see in here, they could potentially be changing what you see in here. Uh, you know, in Ghost in the Shell, there is the laughing man who is able to block himself out of everybody's cybernetic eyes so nobody actually knows what he looks like. Uh, you could also look at Black Mirror, because of course there's a Black Mirror episode about this. Uh, for There's an episode called Men Against Fire, where soldiers are told they're going off to fight monsters, mutants, these terrible, monstrous creatures. Uh, and then a little flaunt, you know, a bug in the software reveals to one of the soldiers, no, these are innocent civilians that you've been hunting down and killing. Right? And now you may say, okay, this is all well and good if you have cybernetic eyes. We're a little ways away from that. But there are a lot of subtle ways that this could be done. You know, for example, thinking about um, advertisers who could swap out billboards for their ads without you knowing. Uh, thinking about political operatives who could maybe every time you see a, a politician, make them a little bit uglier or something like that, right? To, to just subtly influence your perceptions. We need to be careful with who has access to this data, both in and out, because these are the types of possibilities that are going to come when more and more people start to wear these augmented reality glasses and headsets. So we've talked about the good, you know, how XR technology can make life better for a lot of people. We've talked about the bad, some of the risks that come with it. So how do we have the best of both worlds? Well, Again, I'm going to start with three because I only got half an hour here. Um, the first one is on-device processing. So doing as much as you can on the device and not in the cloud. Uh, the Vision Pro actually has a pretty good policy about this, for now at least, uh, where the Pro acts as a gatekeeper between the data that is coming in from your sensors and the uh, apps that might want to use that data. Right? So it's not just like every single app has full access to all your cameras and everything. It, they only get access to what it needs in order to function. There's also things like uh, the, the optic ID it uses for authentication is stored on device. Because as we know, uh, once your biometric data gets into the cloud, it's a little harder to change than a password. Uh, there's a really great paper on this called Bystand AR uh, by Corbett and his team. Um, that talks about this idea of uh, basically automatically filtering out all bystanders from a scene. You know, it, you have the camera, the camera input coming through, uh, it identifies all the faces and blurs all of them out before it gets to a third party, except for the person you're talking to, right? There's a certain threshold uh, where between eye contact, voice communication, and other clues that tell you this is the single person I'm interacting with, that one person gets their face and other information sent off in order to get info about. Everybody else is kept private. 
Uh, data transparency and control is another big one. We're talking about your right to know what is being collected and for what purpose. You know, are AIs being trained on my gaze information? Uh, control access to your data and revoke it when necessary, and to make sure that your data gets deleted when it's no longer needed. Now, if you're from Europe, congratulations, you have the GDPR, and that protects you from a lot of this stuff. If you're in the US, Anyway, there's a great, uh, great paper by uh, Elise Dick of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation a few years ago uh, that lays out some of the things that ought to be done on this uh, for kind of policymakers, lawmakers. So if you're interested, uh, I have that reference. I will happily send it to you. Uh, and finally, because I think I just have a few minutes left here, consent. You know, consent is the oldest and best way of protecting privacy, right? You consent to be recorded, you consent to having your data used in order to help disabled people navigate the world. Um, there's a lot of conversation about how to get consent in a feasible manner, right? Because, you know, if I had a headset on right now, I couldn't just walk around and ask every single one of you, hey, can I use this? Uh, but you could imagine a scenario where, for example, uh, somebody's in a hospital and all of the doctors and nurses have some type of token, you know, like a QR code they wear on their shirt or something else that a headset could recognize and say, ah, these people have opted in to facial recognition. It's okay to tell them, you know, tell the, the person using the headset their name and their info and all of that. Um, there's a lot of interesting models around that. We don't have time to get into them now, but uh, again, making sure that we have systems in place that know who has and who hasn't consented to having their information recorded uh, is gonna be vital as we go forward. So that is uh, XR accessibility and privacy in a nutshell. Um, I really wanna thank you all for coming. I wanna thank uh, you all for having me. This is my first time at DEF CON. Uh, it is a weird and wonderful place. Um, and I would love to take a few questions in the time we have left. I see y'all just came here to get comfy. <laughs> All right, well, if anybody has any, uh, feel free to come talk to me. Uh, you can reach us at xraccess.org. That's X-R-A-C-C-E-S-S dot O-R-G. Um, we have uh, some really great resources. We have a research network. If you're doing research into these related topics, definitely reach out to us because we want to shine a spotlight on you um, because it takes all of us coming together to solve these problems. So we need the tech companies, we need the legislators, we need the watchdogs, we need the disabled people, and we need all of you with your expertise. Uh, so I think we'll end it there and thanks so much. <laughs>